started the program, I didn't have a clue what to expect. And then the fact that we had to meet each other on Zoom was a little strange. I thought, how am I going to pair up with somebody? But the truth of the matter was, I met Noah, the scientist that I'm paired with, and I knew almost right away that this was the person I wanted to work with. And it was because I asked him a question, he leaned into the screen to look up the answer, and his eyes got all fired up like, oh good, I can talk about my chemistry. And the idea that he was so excited about his work, because I'm excited about my art, I thought this is going to be a good pairing. But I still didn't know what the heck we were going to do. And it was about water, and I've been fascinated by water my, my entire artistic career. So I thought this would, this would be good too. But then we started to meet week after week, and I found each week I learned more about what he was doing and more about how it related to what I'm doing. That was incredible. Because you think about art and you think about science as two different spheres. In fact, one of the questions that we got from someone was, what's it like to work with someone with an analytical mind when you were a creative? And all the things fired off in my mind, I was like, that's insane because Noah's work is terribly creative, and my work needs to be analytical. We have both, we use both all the time. This is the story of what's happened to all those kelp beds that have been taken over by sea urchins, and when you look closely, I mean, there's, the underlayer is in fact the spines of sea urchins and these sea stars that have moved in and the Dungeness crab that have been lost and, you know, um, but I think you can just get lost in also that beauty of the patterns in nature that repeat over and over. I mean, as destructive as these are, they're really beautiful. <laughs> and I think we've spoke about it a few times that these panels nicely convey the message of discovery and that's what we do in science as well and you start you have this big data set and you plot it and you look at it at first and try to grasp like the big features but then you have to dive in more and more and more and you find more and more details and like these panels in the whole they will show they will give an impression but you can really go deeper and find these details and when you come back to educational purposes, kids can look and say, oh, what is this critter? And then, for example, here, there's this CTD, which is a typical standard oceanographic instrument, so they can say, oh, what is this? And then you can give more information about how we use it and what you get out of it. And I think, yeah, and even we, we come here and we're like, oh, cool, you, you know, we didn't even <laughs> see this. Um, and I think that's also even that um, the print it'll give you a sense of discovery because in the beginning I didn't see that Deb um, implemented the whole map and the ocean currents in there because you look at it and you see the fish and the cold and the critters but then you look closer and it's again a uh, discovery so I think it even comes out um, in these prints. I think it also um, parallels how we work as, as Svenja was saying I think we so often we delve down into the data and we go down a rabbit hole and it's actually really hard to get out again and, yeah. and so on and to step back and see the bigger picture and so if this could be done with these panels as well where you zoom in and then zoom out again mm -hmm. to actually both see the level of detail and uh, the really minute um, aspects to it and then also see the bigger picture I think that that would be um, how scientists work yeah. with the data artists have approached this so I think that that would be a really powerful yeah. message I call them primary producers because they are the thing that makes life possible Absolutely. they capture the sun's energy or in some cases chemical energy and they give us the carbon and the oxygen that we need to um, to make life possible. And you talk about like the big forest, like the rainforest. Yeah, I think rainforest. it's I think it's easy to see them burn and be like, we are losing them. We are losing our lifeline. But it's hard. We just happen to see at this scale mm -hmm. to understand um, that in a lot of ways we're burning the microbes chemically by making the oceans more acidic. Um, we are burning them by dumping excess nutrients into our water, making it so that we create literal dead zones where nothing that breathes oxygen can live. Um, and those are underwater, they're small, they're hard to see, so we don't, we don't understand that we're you know, burning our lifeline in a way. 
Um, something that I think oceanography has always struggled with is it feels mundane. Um, I know, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, Sabara is like bringing um, a beauty to uh, being conscious and aware of it. Space seems sexy. The ocean does not seem that sexy. After we start showing people what's really in the ocean, see, they haven't seen it. No. They, they just know about sharks. And sharks <laughs> are definitely not sexy. I've always wanted to do like Osmosis Jones. Have you seen that? It's like a, it's a cartoon about the cells in your body and how they all talk to each other. I've always wanted to make a cartoon like that for, for plankton. Because I think they're just as beautiful and they do really interesting but, stuff together you know, too. But with the plankton, the, the forms are just, I mean, they're heavenly, really. And yes. the detail and the texture, it's just mind-boggling. In some ways, in fear of it, because it's so powerful, the ocean can, you know, take you if you're not careful. But it's also beautiful. And um, yeah, really striking and life-giving. Now that I'm thinking about it, <laughs> if you think about it, um, the whole universe was created without a blueprint. I mean, there was no blueprint for, for the universe to exist, and it existed. So I think in everything that we do, there is a blueprint that already exists in nature. When I make a form. It's not coming out of my head. It's based on something that has been created yeah. by a power that you can call that power what you will. Creator, God, Allah, Brahma, you know, everything is, is it's the same power that creates. And um, that's why my process makes it very, very satisfying because it's a very meditative process, just stitch by stitch, um, piece by piece, building up. Um, just delving and, and thinking about where are these thoughts coming from. Um, I think that's how I see the whole universe. I see the whole earth and I see all the creatures on it. I want you to see it because every time I look at them I see something different but you always have like such a unique and like powerful perspective. Um, so it's because it's exciting and strange. And <laughs>
that sort of uh, reinforced their theory that they were spawning there. So I was trying to find some way visually that I could work my way into what she was studying because she had pretty much wrapped up her research in the field and she was more analyzing it on the computer. So I started thinking about plankton, which larval tuna are in their plankton stage, which means that they can't swim against the current, they just drift along with the current. So there are so many different kinds of plankton that are in that environment that I started branching out to study them. And um, I wanted to actually see some in person, um, not just pictures that I found on the web, which I actually found quite a few. But I bought a microscope and went down to the water near where I live and collected samples. And I was amazed to find that there were a lot of plankton in my samples. So that was really fascinating. And Research is as sound and important and wonderful as it probably is. It's not very dramatic. It doesn't really have a story arc. You know, we tried to fit it into um, the typical uh, story of a, um, a hero's journey. And we couldn't quite do that, but we were kind of cemented on the idea of a, a story book and one with educational value that was really important to us. And we knew probably that there might be some hardback copies of this book, but we really wanted a digital so that we could, you know, it could have a wider audience. And starting to think about how we were going to get this story visualized, um, I had the idea of personifying some of what I call the characters in her research. There's carbon, there's radioactivity, there's an element called thorium, which does a big part of the job that um, she's doing. Um, so I thought if, if this is about the carbon cycle, the carbon pump where carbon goes through our atmosphere continuously, through the ocean, through the earth, up in the atmosphere, back again. I thought of a juggler. So I made this character in this kind of contained, uh, almost like a snow globe, um, and that has come to represent carbon. Um, and then I tried this other kind of image um, for the carbon cycle. Um, with all these gears and uh, he's on a unicycle and he's still juggling. So those two images will probably come together in some form where I can use them separately or together. Um, I wanted to do something with radioactivity, which as I mentioned is a very kind of um, non-visual and very abstract concept. But in talking with Jen, um, I heard her say over and over again, it's a force that, um, that continuously chips away at atoms. Um, so I had this idea, I didn't want to use human hands because I didn't want to introduce anything human about it. Um, so I have these kind of mechanical hands um, with a, a chisel and a hammer that's constantly uh, chiseling away at atoms. Over here, uh, the element of thorium, which is what we call the timekeeper, she attaches thorium to um, car, or she doesn't do it, but thorium attaches itself to carbon, and thorium has a half-life because it's radioactive, and um, she can measure how much and how long carbon has been in the ocean. So. This is my kind of visualization, personification of thorium. And a lot of these images start as paint on paper, and then they're modified and manipulated on the computer to add um, other elements to them. For instance, in the painting, just for, because of, it's just too hard to create 
um, what is going to symbolize the carbon atom, which is a, like a cluster of pearls. Um, it's too hard to do that so small. So I have, I have a digital image of it, and when I get this on my computer, I can just plot that, Photoshop that image in wherever I want it. So part of this, um, the second part of uh, this project is integrating the text um, with the imagery and setting up the pages, laying out the pages so that the text makes sense with the imagery. Um, now, this image, which is about this text, which says, our scientist and oceanographer of all things, is captivated by the beauty of the natural phenomena around us. This image doesn't e exist in paint or on paper. It's um, a, a bunch of photoshopped images um, looking as if somebody's looking through binoculars. Um, to show the kind of the whole panoply of uh, nature, sea life and plant life and um, all kinds of creatures, birds. This is kind of uh, air, ocean, the depth of the ocean, carbon atoms, phytoplankton. Again, this image does not exist on paper or in paint. It's all of these images which I painted separately that I then can compose on the computer and make an image.